So tonight we're going to do chapter 135. It's not such a long chapter in Tehillim, Psalms. We have time for a little bit of an introduction since it's not just a long chapter, so I'm going to briefly go over some important ideas that relate to this chapter and to several additional chapters that we're going to be learning until we complete the book. We're almost at the end. Solomon says, Shalom Elech says, he asks, It doesn't make sense. Why should a fool acquire wisdom? Why should he make an effort to study if he has no heart? What does it mean that he has no heart? He's not serious. He's not submissive. He has no fear of God. So what is the purpose of learning Torah, of learning wisdom? What good will it do if he has no foundation? The fear of heaven is really the foundation. The study of the Torah, of course, is very, very valuable, very important, but without a proper foundation, whatever you build up could come toppling down, as it has for many people under very, very difficult challenges. If they would not have had fear of heaven, they would not have been able to resist. So in the end, the fear of heaven is of great importance, on which we can further build the knowledge that we acquire. How do you acquire fear of heaven then? The rabbis tell us, what does this compare to? Imagine somebody has the keys to a safe. He got the keys to open up the safe in the house, but they did not give him the keys to the house. How is he going to get to the safe? What good is it if you have the keys to the safe, if you don't have the keys to the house? Yirat Hashem is the key to the house. Before we can get to the safe, before we can get to the knowledge, to the Torah, we have to have the fear of heaven. This fear of heaven is something that is acquired over a long period of time. It's not just, just like that. Knowledge, depending on how good of a retention you have, how good your memory is, some people acquire it faster than others. But with time, we can all acquire some knowledge. Yet at Shamayim requires tremendous effort. The fear of heaven is not something so easy. Because it requires for one to be submissive, for one to be prepared to do the will of Hashem, whatever it may be. As a result of that, you can understand why not too many nations, not too many peoples, have that fear of heaven, that they are willing to do whatever Hashem says. What do they have instead? They claim they're religious, they claim they believe in something. All they have is rituals, practices, based on what? Based on a system that they have created, they have erected, a moral system, it's moral. They have erected this moral system that conforms to their desires. So idolatry, which is pretty much what I'm describing, is that type of a system. Not too many responsibilities, no fear of heaven, just a bunch of practices, beliefs, traditions that conforms. It's easy, it conforms to people's desires. Yirat Hashem is something very, very serious. It means that I recognize God as the creator of the world. I recognize Him as the one that's responsible for everything. And this Yirat Shemaim, this fear of heaven, will help us in many, many areas. It will help us in observance of the mitzvot. It will help us deal with all kinds of challenges that come our way. It will help us grow. The fear of heaven is ultimately what every Jew needs to develop. So we're back to the question of, so how do you acquire this fear of heaven? Tehillim, the book of Tehillim, puts an emphasis on this, even though he doesn't say it clearly, but if you look at the very, very beginning, he tells us that it's important to associate with the right people, not with mockers, not with sinners, not with evil people. You want to be around good people, positive people, people who are serious and responsible because they have the ingredients 
for developing Yerat Shemayim. You don't have to be Jewish. You have to have certain ingredients. Without those ingredients, Solomon says, Lama zebiyatzil. It doesn't make sense for a fool or for a marker to pursue this chokhmah. You think he's going to learn this? He's going to get anything from it? If his foundation is to make fun and to belittle, not to be serious, then it's a waste of time. So how do we become serious? By learning about how good Hashem is to us, how kind He is to us, by contemplating the creation, by observing everything that He has done. What will that produce in us? It will produce a very important characteristic in that called Akarata Tov. Akarata Tov is gratitude. We've spoken a lot about the importance of being grateful. Judaism has many, many blessings that we make just for this purpose alone. Don't forget to be thankful for everything you have. This is what bonds us with Him. This is what creates that unique and strong connection through blessings, through prayer, and of course through the study of Torah too, but especially by praising Hashem, by thanking Hashem, which is a lot of what Tehillim is about. So the reason I'm giving you this introduction is because a lot of the chapters that will follow towards the end of Tehillim goes back to that theme that we've discussed in the past, not necessarily that Vida Melech's experiences, his personal life, his troubles, but look at the history of mankind, look what Hashem has done for you, and look what He will do for you, and you can trust that He will. So that is why these chapters are important, even though they may seem just praises, praises to Hashem about things that happened in the past. No, but we're talking about in the end, how do we acquire the fear of heaven? How do we develop that? If you are not going to ever say any words of praise or thanks to Hashem, it's impossible. I don't see any way that a person will have true fear of heaven. I say true fear of heaven because some people are afraid. They're afraid of being punished. That's not called fear of heaven. That's called being afraid. Fear, fear is reverence, is being respectful, realizing that we owe everything to Him. Rabbis tell us, I don't recall where I've seen it. One of the grand rabbis said that if it would be worth it for a person to come down into this world just to be able to say Amen once, just to be able to praise Hashem, even if it would be for a brief moment, for that alone it would be worth for him to come down. In other words, the reward is immense in the afterlife. If one prays sincerely with Kavanah, if one really means the words he says, they make a world of a difference. The Kabbalah discusses this more at length. What our words and what our prayers accomplish. So it's not only for us, it's actually something that we accomplish. Something happens as a result of our words. We're pressing certain buttons in the upper worlds. And even though we don't, we don't see necessarily the immediate results of those actions, they actually produce something. Rabbis tell us that Hashem has a notzar, He has a treasure house, where He stores many of the tears that were shed. They were not wasted. And He will use them in the future. In other words, those tears may not have gotten anywhere at the time, but they're not wasted. Prayers, therefore, are not wasted. Hashem may not listen to those prayers right now, but they're put aside. And if they did not help you, maybe they will help a child. They will help your grandson. It was, in the end, those tears and those prayers have not been wasted. So before we begin chapter 135, it's important to keep in mind that the Jewish people are servants of Hashem, they are children of Hashem, and in order to be a good servant, you have to recognize who this Master is and what He does for you. This will help in our commitment to Him, this will help in building up that relationship with Him. So that is why these chapters, even though they seem to be just general statements about how great Hashem is, they're very powerful. The segula for this perek, the special powers of this chapter, is lashuv betshuva shlema, if one needs help, returning to Hashem, repenting, mending his ways, realizing that he may have made many mistakes, and he wants Hashem to help him, this chapter is good for that. Pasuk Aleph, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Shem Adonai, Hallelujah, Dei Adonai. So we're praising Hashem, Hallelujah. 
and we're praising the name of Hashem, offer praise, you servants of Hashem. So it's interesting that he uses here the word Ya, Yud Hey. That's a, a brief name, a short name of Hashem. It is a name, nonetheless. And we've seen the, that word, hallelujah, before as well. But why bring it in here? We're talking about praise after all. So hallelujah is praise. But the yud, hey, these two letters represent koach of Hashem, the power of Hashem as seen in creation. And as can be seen in the many, many wonders. And he's going to be talking about many of the wonders that he performed in Egypt. So he's calling our attention to this. Praise Hashem and praise His name as well. The name is more referring to the next chapter. The next chapter, 136, is in some ways a continuation of these praises, of what he's saying towards Hashem. But who is the one that should be praising? Who's the one that should be saying these words? He's saying, Avdei Hashem. Who are these servants of Hashem? Shomdim bevet Adonai bechatzot bet Eloheinu who stand in the house of Hashem in the courtyards of the house of our God. In other words, if you have the privilege of being in the house of Hashem, if you somehow are lucky and are able to be in a synagogue, you know, able to be in the house of study, able to be in the temple, then you have more of a responsibility to express your thanks to Hashem in such a holy place. So these are the servants of Hashem who are there constantly who are they? The Kohanim and the Leviim. When we had a Bet Amidash, they were regulars. They had to be very careful with their job. If a Kohen would make a mistake, <laughs> as they say in English, he could blow it. <laughs> he could ruin it. The Korban, the sacrifice. It could be dangerous too for the high priest to make mistakes, especially in Yom Kippur. It was a very delicate job. So some people may say, well, Judaism is something that you're born with. It's a privilege. No, besides that, it's really a responsibility, much more than a privilege. Just because you're biologically Jewish, because your mother was Jewish, that's very nice. But more than it is a privilege, it's a responsibility. We have to remember that we are Avdei Hashem, we are servants. And those who are in the Chatzot Bet Elokeinu, those who are in the courtyards, who stand in the house of Hashem, in the courtyards of the house of our, of our God, they have a greater responsibility to express their thanks and praise to Hashem. Hallelujah, ki tov Adonai zameru lishmo kinaim. That's verse number three. Praise Hashem for, the, for Hashem is good. Sing to His name for He is pleasant. Naim means pleasant. In other words, contemplate, look around see all the good that he has done and you will also observe that he's naive everything is so pleasant look at the fruits the many many fruits that Hashem created in the world look at their colors look how they are attractive look how they draw your attention so you should come and pick it there's so much to look at so much detail and it's all pleasant it is man who makes it unpleasant through his actions but everything is tough Everything is so beautiful and everything is so good. You have so much to be thankful. You have so much to praise Hashem for. Just look around. Now he's preparing us here in this chapter with all of these descriptions of how to praise Hashem and why to thank Hashem because soon he's going to talk about the other camp, the ones who worship idols, how they are far from doing this. So that's why he first reminds us, look, this is what you should notice. And this is what you should be doing, serving the only God, the one who created the world, the one that has all this might, the one that made all this goodness. And what did he do after he created all this goodness? He chose one nation to represent him in this world. He chose this one nation 
who came from the seed of Yaakov. Now, look, he does not say Abraham, and he does not say Yitzhak, even though there are forefathers. And I'll explain why in a moment. But he chose Yaakov for himself, Israel as his beloved treasure. So why is it that he's choosing Yaakov? Well, he's choosing one nation that will receive the Torah and live the life of a servant of God and be an example for everyone else to follow. So therefore, the goal of the Jew is to be a Mamlechet Kohanim Egoi Kadosh, a priestly nation, a holy nation, who will be, as well, a teacher for everyone else. So if we set a good example, others will follow. The idea, the original idea, was not just that he chose us and that's it, everybody else just do what you want. No, that's not the idea. The idea is that they should learn. At the very least, the seven Noahide laws. If we would have done our job right, if the rest of the world would have done their job right, it would be a completely different type of world. That never happened, unfortunately. So he's giving us here a little bit of a background of why it happened, how it happened. And he chose the seed of Yaakov because from Abraham you still have some pesolet, you still have some impurity, you have Ishmael. From Yitzhak you also have pesolet impurity, you have Esav. Yaakov is chosen because it is from him that you are able to develop a nation consisting of 12 tribes who will be ready to accept the Torah sometime after they leave Egypt. So that's why Yaakov is being emphasized over He is the one that's chosen. Another reason why he points to Israel being segulato, being his treasure, his beloved treasure, Zohar explains that this has to do with the way the world is managed or run. The Zohar explains that the nations of the world, they all have a sar shememune alehem. They have a minister who is responsible for them. In this world, you know, there are many, many laws, the laws of physics. The weather runs according to certain rules or laws. So the same thing is with a nation. A nation somehow, somehow is managed through sarim, through ministers in the upper world. Each nation has one. We have a Shem. Hashem chose us, we are directly under Him. So when we talk about Ashgacha Pratit, what does that mean? Of course there's Ashgacha, God supervises the world, that's called divine providence. He's aware of everything, He's involved if He chooses to be. Right? He can interact, He hears our prayers, even though He's so far away, apparently He's not so far because He fills the entire universe, but He seems to be far. No, He's actually everywhere. Can you turn to him? Can you pray to him? Will he listen to you? Of course. He will hear what you have to say. Because he's everywhere. This concept of, of God being the creator and involved and hears everything that's going on, records everything, all our actions, this is not very familiar to the rest of the world. We study about it, so we know a little bit more about the Hashgacha of Hashem in this world. But now, David Amel is telling us, it's not that, that Hashgacha I'm talking about, I'm talking about that the Jewish nation is a segula, favorite treasure. Yeah. That means we have something called Hashgacha Pratit, which means individual. Hashem relates to you as an individual, not only as a nation, not only as the world, where he sees and supervises the entire world all the time. Hashgacha Pratit means that there could be miracles done to an individual. Hashem will be involved in your life, will hear your prayers, not just the prayers of the group, of the synagogue. So that is what is meant by Segula, his favorite treasure, his beloved treasure, which he takes care of with a lot more attention. For I know that Hashem is great, our Master is greater than all supernal beings. What supernal beings? Is there anything else? We know Hashem Echad, Hashem is one. Obviously he's talking about Malachim. There are other creatures in this world that are very powerful. 
Angels can be powerful. Shedim, demons are powerful. They don't have the permission to do anything they want. But nonetheless, they are supernal beings from the higher worlds. But don't forget, he's the boss, he made them all. This misunderstanding or lack of clarity in this area is what led uh, in, the, in, the, in the past, Midorosh el Enosh, the generation of Enosh, to make the mistake of worshipping idols. As the Rambam explains, how did, I, how did idolatry all begin? They all were very, very familiar with God. This is the beginning of creation. Everybody knew who God was. But they were also aware of all the stars and the galaxies and all these supernal beings that are very powerful. And they thought, well, these are the servants of God. We have to respect them too. The problem is that with, with time, they forgot about the master and only remembered the servants. So they thought that they only have to respect and only worship all these powers out there. And they are powers, but they are not independent powers. They cannot do anything on their own. Hashem is the one who is above everything else. And that is what he points out over here. That we are taught that. Because I know that, and you should also know that. Hashem is greater than anything else. Look at verse above. So anything means an uh, angel? Okay. It could be angels, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Powers, angels. All that Hashem desires, He has done in the heavens and on the earth, in the seas and in the depths. So He's reminding us that Hashem is everywhere. He controls everything. He not only created all of this, but He's actually aware of everything that's going on, even in the depths, beneath the water. No one should come and say, well, there's a God of war, there's a God of the ocean. Remember, this is what they thought in the past. There's different kinds of gods. No. So he clarifies that. Don't make the mistake of thinking that there's different powers in other areas of creation. But the problem is that not, any, not enough people analyze what is going on and they don't realize that there's one source to all of this and that is Hashem. Verse Zayim. This is just a continuation of his description. Nesi'im is mists, like clouds. He causes mists to rise from the ends of the earth. Berakim la matar asa. He makes lightning for the rain. And Motzeruach Motzrotav, he brings forth the wind from his vaults. So, yes, even the Santa Ana wind, Any, anything. It's from the Shammai. Hashem controls that. Even though it's true that there are certain rules in place, and those rules pretty much are activated and work on their own, but never think for a moment that they're entirely on their own. If Hashem would remove His presence from this world, even for a split second, everything would cease to exist. So Hashem is there at all times. He created these rules, and they pretty much follow those rules. Unless man breaks his rules, so nature will break its rules as well. So here you have an example of everything in creation that was designed by Hashem, and Hashem did not just design it and leave, but is still involved and still connected to it. Now, He told us all this because He's about to share with us all the miracles that happened in Egypt. So he says, this too, don't minimize all of that what you see on a regular basis. These are miracles too. But we're used to it. The sun comes out every morning. We're used to it. It's a miracle. It's a miracle that planet Earth does not get too close to the sun or does not go too far away from the sun. On the average, it's 93 million miles away from the sun. Just right, so that it can be warmed up so that he could allow for life to exist here. Otherwise we would freeze if it would be too far, we would burn up. Just try to go to Venus. <laughs> you can never make it there. It's too hot. 
So this is just a way of seeing how everything is a miracle. It's not just something beautiful, it's a miracle. And it's a miracle that it continues to exist and to provide whatever it is that it's providing us. Okay, now you want a miracle that is something that you perhaps can identify more as a miracle? Fine. So let's turn to Egypt now. This same God that created the world, that gave us all what we see, it's the same God. It was He who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, of man and beast. In other words, remember that one? Makat Bechorot, the plague of the firstborn? That was Hashem too. Now why does He have to tell us that? Not because it's so unusual, but because that particular Makkah of all the Makot, Hashem says, I am doing it myself. It's not going to be through any messenger. I will be involved. Only Hashem can distinguish who's the firstborn and who's not. You cannot just send the angel of death over here. So it was Hashem who did this. And that's why he points to this plague and not to the plague of blood or frogs or lice or any of the other plagues. Because they were wonders too. But what did the Egyptians say? The sorcerers, the, they first thought, well, we can duplicate that too. You brought frogs? Oh, we'll bring frogs too. The first time they admitted that they can't do it was when? With Makat Kini, or well, lice, so we can't do lice. It's too small. And our tradition says that something that small, the demons have no way of controlling it or reproducing it. Mm -hmm. So that is the first time that they admitted, it's by Elohimi, this must be the finger of God. So many things that happen around us, people can claim they're acts of nature. Yes, but who produces these acts of nature? Who's behind those acts of nature? There's a shame. But Nonetheless, he chooses here to talk about the more miraculous one. That was Makat Bechorot. Don't think that that was just a plague. The firstborn died. Somehow. That cannot happen just somehow. It can't be. That was a real Makat, a real plague that only Hashem could deliver. What else did he do? Verse 10. Shalach ototu mofetim betochechem mitzrayim befarao bechol avadav. He sent signs and wonders into the midst of Egypt on Pharaoh and all his servants. So all the other ones, the Otot and the Mofetim that the Egyptians experienced, those were from him too. Even though we just said he did Makat Bechorot, don't think the other ones were done by someone else. Oh, Moshe took some classes in witchcraft and he was able to perform all of that. No, no. Whatever Moshe did, whatever Aharon did, was through Hashem. But people may say that. People say that about the Torah. Wow, the Torah is so beautiful. It was a very intelligent committee <laughs> that put it together. Now, if you really analyze the Torah, no committee can put together something like that. No human being can put something like that together. Make promises and keep them in the future. A human being can do that. Don't work on the entire seventh year, the Shemitah. And I promise you on the sixth you'll have the yield of three years worth. Of. And they saw this happening. Which committee or human being can promise something like that? But people who are trying to avoid religion, avoid committing to be servants of God, they will come up with any kind of excuse not to acknowledge that there's a, there's a God. So that's why he emphasizes very strongly all the ototu team, all the signs and wonders in the midst of Egypt, those came from Hashem. What else did Hashem do? Verse Yud. Sheikah goyim rabim varag melachim atzumim. It was Hashem who struck down many nations and he slew mighty kings. Well, maybe it was the Jew who was the a warrior who was strong, maybe it was his air force with the best pilots who did it. No. Don't make the mistake of ever saying that. 
that it was the Israeli Air Force, the Israeli Army. They are the heroes. No. That's why we need these Pesukim of Tehillim. Hika, Hashem did it. Hika goim rabim, many nations. Ve'arag melachim atzumim, powerful nations. You want an example? Verse 11. Le'sichon melech ha'emori, le'ok melech ha'bashan, le'chol vam le'chol k'na'an. It was, for example, Sichon, the king of the Amorites, Og, the king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan. Many difficult battles. And it could not have been the Jew who won because he was not experienced. Why are these being chosen? Because they were experienced warriors. You know who Sichon and Og were? Powerful giants. Mamlechot Canaan? That was not an easy battle to deal with the Canaanim, the Canaanites who were there for so long. All of these nations were experienced at war. The Jews were not experienced. They never saw war. They were slaves. But somebody can say, ah, they're courageous. They're fearless people. All kinds of excuses. No. Hashem is the one that did so. So, the Jewish nation, as they're going through the desert on their way to Eretz Israel, they see many, many miracles. And they are taught valuable lessons in how Hashem runs this world. Hashem takes care of your livelihood. You saw this with the man coming down every day. Hashem provided you with water. Hashem protected you from the elements in the desert. Look what He did to your enemies. He defeated them. Look how He got you out of Egypt. Did you forget? So all of this has to emphasize and be taught to kids, hopefully, early on, so that they should understand as the Prophet says, it's not through your power, it's not through your strength, but through the Spirit of Hashem that you will be able to win. You can't do it on your own. If Hashem does not want you to win, you won't win. What happened to the land of these nations? Verse 12. And he gave their lands as a heritage, a heritage to his people, Israel. Yes, the land too. Don't think it's just war, battle. Once they were defeated, it is Hashem who decides who gets the land. Don't think that you automatically are entitled to it. If Hashem does not want you to have it, they'll take it away from you. They'll come back. No. Hashem says, I'm giving you this as an Ahala. But why repeat it? As a heritage, as a heritage to Israel. You said as a heritage. So the commentaries explain that this part of the Jordan, the eastern bank, or that area of Bashan, the lands of Sichon, were not necessarily designated to be part of the land of Israel. But Hashem gave it to us. He added it to the land of Israel. And that is where you had Reuven, Gad, and half of Menashe. They occupied those territories. So Nahala, a heritage, is also from Shemaim. Why is this so important, you may ask? It belongs to us. <laughs> Up until recently, you didn't have it. It wasn't yours. It belonged to England. It belonged to the Ottoman Empire. It was run over by others. Others occupied it. You lost it when you were exiled after the Khurban Bayit, after the Second Temple. So, if you are going to be there or not, if you're going to come back to it or not, that's also the Shammai. Even though it's yours supposedly, historically, but look how many claim that it's not yours today. Look how many are giving you a hard time holding on to what you say is yours. It's mine. No, they say it's theirs, the Palestinians. So it has to be that Hashem is the one that gives the Nahala. Otherwise, we won't be able to hold on to it. Verse 13. Hashem, your name is forever. Hashem, your remembrance is throughout all the generations. That's also very, very important to keep in mind that this Hashem, don't think of him as someone who acted in the past, performed miracles in the past, 
שמך לעולם, your name is forever, זכרך לדור ודור, your remembrance is throughout all the generations. In other words, what you did in the past, you will do again. Why not? Who's holding Hashem back from doing it? He said he will. So we're reminding that to ourselves. Hashem, we know for a fact that what you've done in the past, you can do it again, and you all are going to do it very soon. As the Prophet says, Ki mitzrayim ar niflaot. Hashem says, I will show you wonders similar to the ones you saw when you left Egypt. In reality, the rabbis tell us that the wonders that we will soon see are going to be even greater than the ones that we saw in Egypt. So, can you imagine? Great wonders, what we should be anticipating very soon. But what will happen in the end, after Hashem performs all these miracles? There will also be a day of judgment. Look at verse 14. <laughs> Indeed, Hashem will judge on behalf of His people and have compassion on His servants. So even though it may appear that the wicked people who persecuted us have been getting away with it, even though it may appear that we've suffered so much and many goyim claim, oh, Hashem abandoned you, He replaced you with someone else. It may appear like that. After all, we're in exile close to 2,000 years. You should know there will come a time when you will see Hashem in action. He has been in action, but the problem is that Hashem's action till now has been Anochi Aster Astir, I will conceal my face. You will not see me, you will think I, I, uh, I just left you. No, there will come a time when Hashem will judge those that hurt us. He will judge on behalf of His people, in other words, those who persecuted us. And on his servants he will have compassion. You know, he will forgive us and come back to us. Yitneham is a special word in Hebrew which basically says he will let go of all the, the trials that he, you know, that we've been experiencing as a result of Hashem's anger with us. So Yitneha means to be appeased or to have compassion over us, to be forgiving, to let go of the harsh treatment of the past. The reason he says it at this point here is because we were just talking about the Nahala, the heritage. And that heritage we didn't have till recently. So don't think just because you don't have it, you will never have, will have it. No, there will come a time, and thank God we're a little bit beyond that. This is 2020, and uh, over 70 years since the land of Israel was returned to Jewish hands. All right, so now we're pretty much completed the portion that speaks about the Jewish nation and what we should be expecting soon. Now he turns to the non-Jewish world. Verse 15. <laughs> The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the product of human hands. A lot of these verses will sound very familiar to you because we say it in Halil. So we're talking about the idols. What are these idols? They may be beautiful, they may be ornamental, but that's all they are. They have no value. They don't do anything. Why? Because they're not really gods. They're Masayya De Adam. They're the product of human hands. Well, isn't that obvious? Yes, of course, who else made it? It could be made in China too, by the way. These days you never know. So, why is he telling this to us? Obviously, an idol is not made by itself. So, the emphasis over here is, look at the type of worship that you see elsewhere. It's empty. It's being directed towards an object that is man-made. There's a lack of willingness in the part of the worshiper to be a servant of God. Remember we talked about before the Yirat Shamayim, the fear of heaven, which requires a lot of commitment and responsibility and values. No, 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 no. Just worship this idol. I spent a lot of money on it. It's made out of gold. 
so what? It doesn't do anything for you. Not only can it not hear what you have to say, it won't do anything for you. You see, what people forget, a very important detail when it comes to religion, is, is the religion doing anything for you? It's not just about we're doing for Hashem. Of course we do for God. Yes. But we don't realize that when we do for Hashem, we're actually doing for ourselves. By complying with His mitzvot, by giving tzedakah, by being kind-hearted, even though we are observing His commandment, showing our respect to Him, it's doing something to us. It's making us a better person. It is refining us. How is that going to happen to someone who's looking at an idol? <laughs> Worshipping something that he created. It's not going to go anywhere. So now he makes fun and describes how useless they are in the following verses. Ted Zion, verse 16. Pelahem velo yedaberu, enayim lahem velo yedu. They have a mouth, maybe. Yeah. But cannot speak. They have eyes, but cannot see. Let's look at the next one too, 17. Oznaim lahem velo yazino, they have ears, but they cannot hear. Af en yesh ruach befihem. Nor is there breath in their mouth. So what is he telling us? They cannot do anything for you. They cannot hear your prayers. It's a waste of your time. They cannot talk back to you. They cannot see you. Why talk about seeing? Eyes. What difference does it make? Because Hashem sees everything we do. And from them you think you can hide. You can't hide from Him. So this is a very nice description of how useless, useless, completely useless these things are in taking the human being and making of him a servant of Hashem. What is a servant? Imagine your boss tells you, I'm going to be away for three months. You know, make sure you do your job while I'm gone. You think any employee, just any employee, knowing that his boss is away from him will do as good as a job, I'm not saying he won't do anything, as good as a job as when he knows that the boss sees everything he does? <laughs> of course not. The average human being will not be as good, as devoted, as if he sees, the, oh, he's looking at me, I better behave, I better do what he told me. He expects a lot from me, and he sees me. A servant of Hashem realizes that Hashem sees him, sees everything he does, hears him, and of course, hopefully will answer his prayers and do a lot for us. All of this is missing with the idols. It's not just because it's an idol out of stone. That's just symbolic. It's the whole concept behind it, the type of religion that is empty here. You can't get anywhere in life by worshipping heaven, vanity. So what does it say in verse 18? Kemohim you also him, kol him. Like them will their makers become all who trust in them. It appears to be he's cursing them. But it's not necessarily a curse. He's telling us that anybody that follows this path, anybody that trusts his life to them, he will turn out like them. In other words, not having done anything with his life, not having accomplished anything. He will be a statue. A statue. Standing, even though we're walking and we're traveling, we don't say, but what did you do? What did you do with your life? So, Kimohem, you are Sehem, those that make these things will be just like them, unproductive. The commentaries also explain that the reason why he says, whoever trusts in them, whoever relies on them, is because these, some of them were very mighty, very powerful nations. And in the end, they disappeared. They didn't succeed. They didn't last for too long. What we see from this is that unless a nation has some merit, some good deed that they perform, they will not be around for a while. They will not have Hashem's protection. 
So since these nations did not have too many of their own merits, we were able to defeat them. That is why there was an accusation against the Jewish people when we left Egypt. Wait a minute. God, you claim that these Egyptians are idol worshippers? A lot of the Jews who were there were also worshipping idols. Why should you show any favoritism or perform miracles on their behalf? So, of course, the attribute of mercy came out and said, how could you compare those that do it voluntarily to those who are being forced to do it against their will? So there's a big difference. So in the end, the Jew overcame the difficulties and defeated the enemies because those enemies did not have any special merit, and they did, the Jews. Verse 19. The last three verses are pretty much the same idea. We're talking about different groups amongst the Jewish people. Bet Israel Barakut Adonai, Bet Aaron Barakut Adonai. You have basically four groups here who is telling them to bless Hashem. The house of Israel, bless Hashem. The house of Aaron, bless Hashem. The house of Levi, bless Hashem. And you who fear Hashem, bless Hashem. Who is the you who fear? I mean, he basically called out all the Jews by saying, the house of Aaron and Levi. He said the house of Israel. I mean, he said pretty much, so who's the, the ones who fear God? The commentaries say the converts. Chassidei umot olam, the righteous amongst the Gentiles. They will have a share to the world to come. They will be around when Mashiach comes. They will be part of those who will serve God in the end of days too. And that's what he calls on to them. To bless Hashem. But why talk about the four groups separately? Just say, all of you who are servants of Hashem, I mean, isn't that what they all have in common? Why point out how each one is different? We have Israel, then we have the house of Aaron, then we have Levi, we have the ones who fear God. In order to answer this question, I'm going to share with you a story with the Chafetz Chaim of blessed memory. There was once a gentleman who approached the rabbi, Rabbi, I don't understand how come there are so many traditions amongst the Jewish people. You have Ashkenaz, you have Sephardic, you have Bukhari, you have Yemenite. You have so many different kinds. Why not just have one? Why do we need all these types? Now we know that a lot of the differences has something to do with the diaspora. We've been in exile and we develop different traditions and customs and so forth. But the question is still a valid question. Why not just join the forces? And why not just be one? Why not have one prayer book for everyone? So the Chafetz Haim answered as follows. I think you should ask this question to the Russian general. General, why do you have tanks? Why do you have foot soldiers? Why do you have artillery? Why do you have an air force? Why do you have all these different parts of the army and the navy too? Who needs so many different parts? Just conglomerate. Make them one. One battalion. One united army. That's all kinds. And what will the general tell you? He will, he will laugh at you. He will say, what these do, they cannot do. Each one has a different function. The air force, the tanks, the artillery, the infantry, they all are important. The main thing is, that they work in unison together against a common enemy. Who is our common enemy of all the Jews? The evil inclination, the Yetzirah. So we need to attack from different angles. There are some that will put their effort into one type of service of God, others that will put their effort and energy into another type of service of God. As long as we recognize that we have a common enemy and we work together, then we will achieve victory. That's the main thing. We're different because some of those differences are necessary. So Hashem obviously put different kinds of souls in this world. You have some who are rabbis, some who are judges, some who are very charitable, and Hashem gave them a lot of money, some who have a beautiful voice, some who have other skills. It's not that one person can have everything. Hashem scatters all these talents everywhere because they are all necessary. They're all needed. And if they work together, then we have cooperation and then we have a successful business. Right? So this is the business of Hashem. 
the service of Hashem, the, the learning and the prayer and the observance of the mitzvot, all of that, the common goal for all of us is to serve Hashem in the right way. So if we were to do this together, even though we're a little bit different, it would work and it would be successful. So that's why he points out that these are all different groups, but they're important because each one in his way does what they're supposed to do. You have, for example, the Beta Aaron, you have the Kohanim in the Beta Midash, you have the Leviim who were singing in the Beta Midash. The Kohanim did not do the singing. Israel did something else. You have different types of functions in the, in the temple. And last but not least, the last verse, 50, uh, 21, Kaf Aleph, Baruch Adonai Mitzion Shochein Yerushalayim Anuya. Bless is Hashem from Tzion who dwells in Jerusalem. Praise Hashem. So here we're talking about the, the fact that we're fortunate that Hashem is with us, that Shekhinah is with us, and even though the temple was destroyed, Lo Zaza Shekhinah Mikotel HaMaravit, the Shekhinah still, the Divine Presence still dwells there. It's still there. And that is where the blessings all come forth. That's a very important idea because if the Shekhinah would not be with us, we would not have all that protection. So he's reminding us towards the end, we need to thank Hashem and praise Hashem for that alone too. As we have observed in the many, many wars that Israel recently has fought, not 2,000 years ago, recently, that the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, was with us. Had it not been, we would not have been able to succeed. And that's the famous mashal of the, the Midrash that says, how is it possible for that one sheep to survive against 70 wolves who are always trying to attack it? It's not because the sheep is very strong. It's because of the shepherd who drives away the wolves. We don't always see the shepherd. We don't see his stick. We don't see him doing it. But the enemy knows better than us how many times they conspired to do all kinds of things against us and they failed. We don't even know all the stories of what they planned to do, but they did not carry it out. And that is the meaning of the verse, Lo seni flaot getolot levado. Hashem does many, many wonders. We saw. No, 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 no. Besides the ones you saw. Levado. He does many wonders for himself that we're not even aware of this. And when Mashiach comes, we will see all of the miracles that Hashem has performed, many of the ones that we were not aware of, and we will realize then how much Hashem has been protecting us all along.